kind uh, introduction, and I would like first to thank uh, Epidiverse for this uh, invitation. It's a very interesting uh, meeting. Uh, we learn a lot of things, and today, yes, I'm really happy to present what we are doing about uh, trees also, and uh, evolutionary and functional impact of uh, epigenetic variation in trees facing climate change. And first I want mainly to explain how we arrived to this project and what we are doing in this project and what we expect to do later. First, I'm plant physiologist uh, and uh, I'm working on the uh, forest trees and we are in the thematic of uh, climate change and forest decline all over the world. And in this very complex thematic, we try to modelize the answer of one very uh, friendly tree, poplar, I will explain why after, on one environmental uh, constraint, dross. And for that, we are working on white up compartment with natural population, and we have questions dealing with population adaptation. But we're also working on poplar hybrids in plantation, and we have questions about breeding and management. On this plant uh, material, we are working on dross, and for dross, uh, with the ecophysiologist of the team, we know that dross intensity is very important to define the physiological response of the tree. At low level of dross intensity, short stress, weak stress, you have productivity variables like growth that are uh, affected, stomatal conductance, photosynthesis, but you are if you are increasing growth intensity, you are more dealing with questions about embolisms and about the survival of the trees. So for a physiologist, you need to have precise stress condition to know what is the physiological response that you are testing in the idea to understand what can be the role of epigenetic in this physiological response. So like you have a diversity of response, you must be clear about what is your constraints and what will be the role of this epigenetic in this field. As we heard uh, from the first day from uh, Carlos Herrera, we know that uh, plants are sometimes seen as mosaics and trees are a very nice example about that because we can consider that trees are more a colony of birds than an individual. And you know that birds, this shoot apical meristem, is a center of morphogenesis. So we have a very interesting uh, system, biological system, with the trees that are long-living organisms that will have to uh, adapt to uh, climate change. Poplar is a model tree for now many years for very uh, good reasons. It has high juvenile growth because we need to have plant material. Also, it is very sensitive to drought, so it's a very good indicator of uh, water availability in soil. We have vegetative, mu vegetative multiplication. It allows us to have clones. And when we, you are doing experimental designs, you can have a lot of repeats without genetic variation and it's a very uh, friendly system to study epigenetic. And we have facilities, we sequence genome since 2006, genetic transformation, etc., etc. In this uh, study, it's quite interesting because we are still in this idea of trees that are mosaisms of buds, and in these very remarkable trees, in the team uh, here of Robert Schmitz with Frank Johannes, they have evaluated somatic point mutation rate and somatic epimutation rate in poplar. And what they have shown is that, of course, here, somatic epimutation rate is much, much higher than what we can measure, actually, with uh, a somatic point mutation. But it's open, the idea that the high rate of epimutation can maybe be interesting for the trees to, uh, to use for this environmental adaptation. In my team, we are working on a very diverse material. We work in greenhouse because we need control condition to understand what is the physiological response of the tree in very defined condition. But we are also working in outdoors condition. It's a tree. We are working on the nursery, in plantation, and we hope to go until the forest because we want to see if what we have observed in greenhouse can be repeated or also estimated in natural population and natural environment. We are also working on RNA lines because we need to, uh, by using reverse genetics, to better understand what we have observed with our uh, genomic analysis. And we have material from hybrids and natural population. But for the environmental constraints, we only focus on uh, water availability. Here you have the relative extractable water, and you have three uh, environmental conditions for poplar. 
uh, well watered condition, you have drought condition, followed by re irrigation. And we play on the intensity of the drought and the duration of the drought. And each time, we do not collect during the stress, we always collect at least one week after the stress and one week after re irrigation and the restart of the growth. What we want to see is not a transient epigenetic modification, but what can be kept at least for one week, and we can hope maybe a little more. I will tell you more about that. And I will explain also later why we are working on Meristem. A few years ago, when we start with this uh, project, uh, so uh, more than 10 years, uh, we work only in greenhouse, we have several genotypes, we put in the environmental condition that I explained you, we phenotype, we do uh, epigenetic analysis. The first one, uh, more than 10 years ago, it was more global dynamethylation analysis. But to do a short story, what we learned about that is that in Schutapical meristem, in the poplar, when you have draws, you have modification of dynamethylation, a strong modification of dynamethylation. And if you wait a little, you can also see that appearance in the primordia that are formed during the stress, but not in preformed leaves and not in leaves after rewatering. Only in leaves develop during the stress. And if you stress in the summer your trees and you came back in winter dormant uh, shoot apical meristem, you can still find modification of the methylation six months after the summer stress. So it's quite stable. Now we are on the last part. We are wanting to know if the next spring there is still uh, epigenetic modification and if it can help the trees to respond to a new cycle of uh, drought. So this is still under question. About, yes, less than 10 years ago, we also decided that we will focus on meristems. I explained you that trees are seen as a, a colony of birds and it's a center of morphogenesis. So you have dividing cells. If you have an epigenetic event in a dividing cells population, you have chance to transmit to a lot of cells your epimutation and maybe to the organs that are formed by these meristems. So for us, it's a very interesting uh, system. And a few years ago, we tried to uh, analyze the first methylome of this uh, poplar by uh, uh, focusing on the open chromatin part of the genome because we know that the transposable element was quite difficult to analyze and we don't have a double GBS at that time. It was just a start and it was not available in poplar at that time. And uh, we focus on this uh, method, we sequence, and what we found, and a lot of other papers have confirmed, is that meristems and shoot apical meristem has very specific machinery for epigenetic and sometimes very specific epimutation compared to the other organs that are different shaped and more stable to the environmental uh, effect. So we decide that we will now focus on uh, meristems. Oh, there is no more light. Uh, if you have another. Oh, it's very weak. Another pointer. Um, we focus on meristems and we will both analyze genetics and epigenetics effect on gene expression, but also on transposable elements because they are also part of the machinery under dynamethylation uh, control and try to analyze the developmental response at three times scale. The immediate response, developmental plasticity, new organs formed during stress, epigenetic memory going to priming, and local adaptation. The first work that we do on that, uh, exploiting our previous analysis, was using one clone, so no genetic variation, and a lot of uh, vegetative multiplication of this clone. So we have a population uh, with no genetic variation that we submit to three water conditions. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, much better. In three water conditions, so uh, droughts, droughts and rewatering, and well watering condition. And as I'll explain you, we focus on shoot apical meristem. So one clone, three water condition, shoot apical meristem, and our idea was to identify the plastic differentially expressed genes and the plastic differentially methylated genes. I mean that for transcript expression level, genes that have significant variation of expression between each situation and also of dynamethylation profile. 
By doing that, we just identify 74 DMRs among uh, 1,000 possible DMRs that we could analyze. And we find uh, 70 decks in these uh, DMRs that show this uh, variation of expression level uh, correlated to modification of DNA methylation. And what was very striking for us is that mainly most of these genes were involved in hormonal pathway. So we look to uh, the functional orientation of these genes and we try to understand, knowing the hormones function and their pathway, how we can explain our system. It's a model. So in well watered condition, Jasmonat activation pathway and ethylene repressor pathway are lowly expressed and lowly methylated. We don't need a stress signal in that condition. In water stress condition, while we obtain the whole genome hypomethylation, these genes were highly methylated and highly overexpressed. And associated to a very strong stress signal, the stop of the growth and we can expect the involvement of the energy of the tree into water tolerance. And after rewatering, the whole genome were hypermethylated, but these genes were selectively demethylated and silenced. That helped to have rapidly a suppression of the signal stress, and maybe it's the prerequisite for the restart of the growth. So we start to have a proposal of model of interaction between hormone and DNA methylation modification. And also we think that it's a correlative approach. We would like now to have more reverse genetic uh, arguments to see if what we have observed is causal, is causal or not. First, we go to the literature in different plants uh, and we realize that there is several articles in different plants showing that there is a very nice cross talk between hormonal balance and chromatin structure modifiers. There is no example of hormones uh, uh, activating or repressing the expression of chromatin modifiers, and there is no example of chromatin modifiers affecting biosynthetic genes for hormone or signal transduction hormone. So there is an interplay between these two that can be particularly interesting in shoot apical meristem. Because in, mer in shoot apical meristem, you can focus on cell identity gene and completely change the new organs. And also, we were wondering why we need epigenetic in this physiological response. Hormone can do everything. Why, why we need epigenetic? We need epigenetic because hormones in plants are acting in very complex balance. And it's very difficult to understand how the cells can perceive this complex balance and go in a very canalized developmental pathway. And we can imagine, and there is some uh, many uh, articles uh, proposing that, that uh, chromatin can act as a hormonal hub of integration. All the balance of hormone is integrated by the chromatin modifiers uh, to follow a developmental pathway that will answer to the stress. The other idea is that hormonal balance, especially in stress, uh, is a very short um, induction of hormones. Usually, most of hormones are induced for a few minutes, few hours, while the developmental response to environment is usually on days or week. To develop leaves, it takes time. Where epigenetic is very interesting because it can stabilize target of hormonal uh, activation or repression pathway for days or weeks by putting epigenetic marks on the gene and controlling their transcription level. So epigenetic and hormonal uh, interaction can uh, participate together to the response of the plant. And of course, most of the time it's reset and we can expect that it allows the sensitivity to uh, new environmental condition. And as you already hear a lot of time, in some case, it's not completely clear for me how and why there is a memory and this can lead to an epigenetic priming. And if you are in shoot apical meristem, you can have also a, a intergenerational and transgenerational phenomenon because there is no germline, but they are coming from the somatic cells in the shoot apical meristem. To go further in our hypothesis, uh, we uh, could uh, use uh, RNA suppression lines that were prepared in uh, Poplar in collaboration with Deep Strauss. 
and uh, on the DDM1 genes that you already heard about, it's a chromatin modifiers, and what is interesting is that finally it affects DNA methylation, even if it's not a direct effect. These trees, in well water in condition, have about no phenotype. Their growth has control. We put again in our uh, specific system of draw finishation, rewatering, and sampling of shoot apical meristem one week later. And the question was, what will be the plasticity of this epigenetic variant? We have to phenotype uh, draw tolerance. Uh, this work was uh, managed by my colleague, Rizus Fischel, and as he could explain you, as a co-physiologist, uh, draw tolerance is a very complex uh, uh, phenomenon. It can be defined by uh, modification of growth, it can be defined by modification of cavitation ability, etc. So it's a very complex term. Here I will show you only few data among what we have tried to, to generate about growth, height and diameter in trees, in control and RNA lines, hypromethylated lines, in uh, well watered and water deficit rewatering condition. As you can see, the very classical answer of poplar is to stop to growth when there is a drought. It's classical, and it's, that's why poplar is so sensitive to drought and interesting for us. But surprisingly, we have no significant decrease of uh, growth in our L RNA lines. It was surprising because we were more waiting for a defect of answer in this line than to a gain of function for tolerance. So we were surprised. We have to uh, do some uh, complementary exp um, experiments on uh, Cavitron. It's a uh, uh, way to analyze the cavitation potential of trees. And you have here these curves for which you can see the P50 value. And the less, the, the more you have a negative value, the more your tree is tolerant to severe growth condition because it's mimicked by Cavitron. So, uh, uh, by cavi its mimic cavitation. And as you can see, we confirm that naturally our RNA lines are more tolerant to severe drought condition. So we go from that, we have a phenotype, and now we can do a lot of genomic analysis. Of course, the first idea is to look for the targets of this modification of methylation and try to understand between control and RNA lines what happened. And we know already that uh, we have modification of hormonal pathway, so we can try to see if we have something in these uh, RNA lines. And like the methylation uh, is suspect to control expression of some genes, but also the mobilization of some transposable elements, we analyze both. To analyze uh, these DDM1 uh, lines, we must compare in uh, environmental conditions, so well watering condition, the white type lines to the DDM1 the DTM1 lines. If you have a modification of methylation for one feature, you can consider that you have a constitutive DTM1 line, DTM1 DTM, DMRs. You do the same in stress condition, but sometimes you have, like here, DMR that are totally stable. They are not affected by the stress, but they were existing before the stress. But you can have also some that are lost in yellow and some in red that are now induced because of the environmental condition. So it's a very complex answer to uh, identify really what has changed in these DDM1 lines. By doing that, we uh, identify a lot of gene group to gene ontology analysis. What is partly very interesting in the new DMR, the DMR that appear in stress condition because I told you that this RNA line has no phenotype in well watering condition, but in stress condition, they show a maintain of growth and a more uh, tolerance. So we are interested to how they react in stress condition. And we find that we have new DMRs, mainly dealing with defense, immune, abiotic stress, and also uh, hormonal pathway. So it was interesting. We have to do RNA-seq analysis and try to see what are the genes that are differentially expressed in stress condition in RNA lines versus Y-type. We find only a small set of uh, subset of genes. And as you can see here, all of these targets are involved directly in hormone transduction pathway or production. We take one of uh, these uh, genes. It's a salicylate methyltransferase. It's a biosynthetic uh, enzymes that was up-regulated. 
and by LCMS, we could confirm that it's true. In stress condition, the RNA lines accumulate more salicylic acid than the Y-type lines. So you have again a feedback uh, control between an epigenetic modification that can target uh, normal biosynthetic genes that upregulate uh, hormones that will participate to the physiological response and maybe also affect the epigenetic of some new gene. So it's a very complex uh, situation, but there is a connection again with hormonal control. In collaboration with uh, Marie Nirouz, uh, we do mobilome analysis, so we try to identify the transposable elements that are expressed in shoot apical of meristems in these RNA lines in well, in well watered or stress condition. We identify about 400 transposable elements that are active in poplar and that we can find for some of them with very huge number of copies. Some of them are stress induced, this one, in all lines, whatever is the line, there is induction of the expression of this transposable element. Sometimes, some are less, are lines uh, specific or line and stress uh, condition specific. We just want to know if some of these transposable elements with a very huge number of copy, extra chromosomal copy, could be inserted in chromosomes. For that, we use qPCR approach. If you have expression of your transposable element but no integration, you will have a ratio one of copy number. If you have expression and integration, when you will select uh, genomic material and suppress extra chromosomic material, you will uh, see a copy number variation. Here you have for three transposable elements what we found for the three lines in well watered and stress condition. As you can see for these two transposable elements with a very large expression, we find a copy num strong copy number variation only in RNA lines, only in stress condition. So there is something that uh, hypomethylation has uh, induced and there is something that allow this modification to integrate while even with a very huge number of copies, there is nothing in wild type. But in RNA lines and stress condition, something happened. There is integration. So first conclusion is the idea that uh, denamethylation in poplar shoot apical meristem play a role on uh, tolerance through the control of hormonal stress response. And it can have interest into acclimation of natural population tolerance for breeding. We have also to see if it can be used for priming. But we have also modification of trans uh, transposable element integration. So we have genome integrity modification. So we can think also to uh, diversity and potentially uh, to adaptation. This fits very well with this view of uh, Yonoyal about the fact that during the adaptation, there is progressive modification from physiological change to epigenetic to copy number to somatic. If you put hormones, active transposable element, and insertion in genes, it's totally possible to explain at the molecular level what they have proposed. And of course, it fits very well with the, the recent paper of the team of uh, Vincent Collot that explained that most of the epi mutations that are environmentally induced will have impact because they will affect transposable element uh, expression and integration. And this integration can be sometimes nearby a gene and have an effect on the phenotypic uh, characterization. And it's a mutation. It's easily transmitted uh, in this population. Like I told you, we are interesting uh, in uh, poplar, but poplar is also a, a, a crop. It's uh, used by human in hybrids for, for wood production. So uh, with uh, several colleagues of the EpiCatch project, so if you are interested by epigenetic and you don't know this cost action, there is a cost action, EpiCatch, that try to animate uh, a lot of uh, um, formation and discussion about the use of epigenetic for crop improvement in a context of uh, global change. So now that we have a lot of data supporting uh, the interest of epigenetic for breeding, we have two solutions. The first is to exploit epigenetic diversity to propagate or to use epi markers to select for new traits in the idea of uh, uh, giving rise to epi breeding, new epi uh, breeding products. To induce epigenetic diversity, there is a lot of uh, solution. 
I will today just mention two that we are also investigating in Poplar. The first is environmental memory, and the second will be the natural population. So uh, two, more than two years ago, uh, we were wondering if what we have observed as modification of DNA methylation in greenhouse, just one week after stress, moderate stress, could be found if we go outside from the greenhouse in, in um, outdoors condition, and if it can be stable at least for a few months. So during the summer, we have uh, trees, clones, that were in a well watered condition, the other in unfavorable condition. And six months after the summer droughts, we go and take the winter dormant shoot apical meristems and we evaluate the DNA methylation for the same trees in the two conditions six months before. And in nursery or plantation system, each time we could find DMRs between the same genotype in the environmental condition that was favorable or unfavorable six months before. And when looking to the genes, to the core genes that are always activated by DNA methylation by distress in greenhouse, nursery, and plantation, we find a small subset of genes. And this subset of genes was clear, clearly enriched on stress in, in abiotic stress genes and hormonal genes again. Now, as I told you, the idea is to know if on the next spring, this can help trees to cope with a new uh, stress. So I take a long time to explain why we arrived to uh, AP3, but it will now maybe have more sense why we are doing that. We have now interest in DNA methylation variation uh, to better understand the expression of some genes and the profile of uh, transposable element and how they can modify and induce somatic mutation in trees in dross condition. And of course now we are back to the field and back to natural population. We want to evaluate the diversity, epigenetic diversity of natural population. So FEP3 is a, a collaborator, collaborative project with many pa partners uh, and on two species, oak and poplar. The idea is that we will analyze 240 individuals of each species in natural population planted in common garden or this population used for greenhouse experiments. I will only focus on few data about poplar. So here you have the, the 10 natural population here uh, in Europe of uh, uh, poplar, of Populus nigra. We take two individuals, two genotypes by pop, so we have uh, uh, 20 uh, genotypes. This time we focus on cambium for uh, wood tree. And we do whole genome bisulfide sequencing on these uh, 20 genotypes, representing the 10 population from Europe, diversity. We identify over 30,000 sites that are variants in the natural population, lowly or highly variant, depending on the population. And the idea is now to capture this subset of sequence in the 240 individuals, and also in the individuals that have been put in greenhouse experiment. So just now for the, the few last minutes, I would just want to show what we are doing with this data. The first, now you have seen a lot of tree uh, these last, uh, this last uh, days. You have our population, and I told you, we have 10 population, and it's very easy, of course, using SNP, because we have also resequenced these trees, to use SNPs to build uh, a tree showing the clustering, the genetic clustering of our 10 European population of black poplar. But if you do exactly the same thing here using the methylation signal uh, inside genes, because we can do so in intergenic, we can do in promoter, so we can decide on the feature and try to see how it affects his, the clustering. But here I'll show you about the gene methylation uh, data. You can see that we have also a very good clustering, perfect clustering of all uh, population with this uh, uh, methylation. We have to try to see, by dividing of our 10 population into three meta population, what is the pan-methylome. I mean, how many genes are methylating uh, when we analyze all the population. And as you can see, depending on the cytosine context, we have between 60 and 85% of the poplar genes that are included in um, our analysis, so that are methylated in one or another population. And if we try to analyze the core methylome, 
it means what is always conserved between all the population. It's also depending on the cytosine context, and it goes from 40 to 71 percent, and of course the highest conservation is for CG, as we can expect. And it's still of 41 percent for CHH. Now we look for other for outliers. So using a strategy like uh, uh, PC adapt, we use methylome uh, information instead of SNP genetic variation to identify a gene under methylation profile that could be involved in local adaptation depending on each context again. Just to show you the situation of CHH, because we speak a lot about CHH this last day, we could see that if we look to the functional genes inside, we have jasmonic acid metabolism, innate humidity, response to oxidative stress, etc. So again, back to, to stress and hormone. It's about my last. We try also to see if we can have a strong difference between uh, impact of dinamethylation and expression. So we select genes that are hypomethylated and upregulated, and genes that are hypermethylated and downregulated. Remember that we are in uh, Cambium. These genes here, the first annotation is lignin uh, metabolic pathway, so it's interesting. And here, it's uh, hormonal response. So again, we have something that is quite interesting comparing to our uh, uh, ID. With a team of GeroSAMS, we try now to build using DNA methylation information in poplar and oak, the ancestral genome of these three, not using genetic variation, but epigenetic variation. And of course, the other work package we go further. My last slide. So in conclusion, we are still very interesting the idea that this epigenome is very in interaction between environment, genome, gene expression, and uh, phenotype. And we would like, of course, to, to learn more using this post plus system, but of course, with a lot of other systems to compare and to better understand. And I think it's what we are doing here is to better understand what we can find in one system, in many systems, and to give sense to this uh, information. So I have finished. I want to thank all the collaborators, and I'm very enthusiastic to hear all the other speakers of this uh, session. Thank you. Um, we have time for questions. We started a bit later, so it's just time. Are there questions in the room? Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, because you said that in your stress experiments when you were looking at the integration of the transposable elements, you, you saw that you need to have a, a mutant of the DDM1, a transient mutant, to, to observe the integration. But you were linking, linking them to adaptation. So I was wondering how you can, you need, need a mutant that you produce, but then still you talk about adaptation. But it's also what we are looking in EP3. We are looking if there is any genetic variation on DDM1 in natural population, and if we can isolate uh, genotypes in natural population with very low expression of DDM1, and that will be hypomethylated. We have already done evaluation of DNA methylation global in a lot of uh, genetic background, and there is a huge variation of DNA methylation value in uh, the different uh, population or species of poplar. Why the genome is quite conserved among the poplar species. So we think that there is natural variation, but of course we don't know if it is here or somewhere else, but we can expect to find hypomethylated pop, natural hypomethylated poplar uh, uh, in some population and see if it's changed their traits. Over there, um, you, Jan. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, so, Christophe, do you know whether the, the mobilized transposable elements that you studied in stress DDM1 RNAi lines whether they have a preference for integration near environmentally responsive genes, and is there also a link to this histone variant, H2AZ, as uh, Vincent Colot's group has shown? Okay, of course, it's a very interesting perspective. The first thing we must say is that uh, we already tried to do some thousand blood analysis 
that on this very repeated sequence, it was quite impossible to find specific probes. That's why first we do qPCR, because thousand was about impossible. So now the idea is to resequence during long reads and to identify. But in this project, we should end and publish, so it was finished. But now in natural population and in the epi uh, uh, experience on this line, because we have hippo and hypermethylated lines, we have a collection of lines, and not only the DM1, we are waiting to see what we will see with this integration, in which condition, and maybe now invest to resequence and find the loci and try to see if it is nearby genes or not. But it's a huge work, so we prefer now to evaluate this phenomenon that we have observed in natural population or in new lines before taking this time. But of course it will be interesting. Any other questions? Anything not in the chat at the moment? Anybody else in the room? We still have time for questions? Yeah, oh, one second, please. Because uh, I have seen that you were able to cluster the individuals depending on the, the location because of the methylation. Can you show that? Uh? Yes, the clustering of methylation on the population. Yes, but they are, they are all coming from Europe, but all they are grown in a common garden. So. Uh, they were in a common garden. We sequence for SNP, but also we sequence for epigenetic. What is interesting is that we cluster perfectly the population, whatever we use, SNP or methylation, all the context, but is, this is when you use CG methylation in genes. After, you can ask different clustering if you use intergenic sequence because they are less conserved, because they have more uh, stochastic DNA methylation events on CHH, etc. So the idea now is to see if this clustering is affected by the feature that you are analyzing. So basically, in, in the plots that you show, you only use genes for the clustering. This clustering was genes, but we have done with other feature, and it's changed the clustering. Thanks. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Any other last question? If not, if you have, if you think of some later, yeah, Barbara. Yeah. So I actually have a question about that because you probably also saw my talk, and I was wondering. I also did all this clustering um, where it was mostly PCAs with different genomic features. And basically the same situation as you saw in my presentation happened. I didn't see any geographical pattern. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Just because I think it's very curious that it's the same species, but just because it's a clone instead of a natural population, um, the results are a bit contradictory. But I think that uh, for CG methylation, it's quite clear now that uh, it's a quite conserved mark. And most of the time, if you use CG methylation, especially in genes, it seems to be very stable. So like it's affected by the genetic variation, you should have usually nice clustering. The question is more about CHH, and in poplar, because there is a high level of CHG methylation also, and also depending on feature. This can be maybe something that is different, and on, of course also on different tissues, because we are working on meristems, yeah. and maybe it can be different in differentiated uh, organs that are not affected by environmental condition anymore. Okay. So. Okay, thank you very much.